our last patient speaker is Yvonne, Yvonne Wren, um, and she's going to be talking about wrestling with warfarin. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a few of the problems that occur when you take long-term warfarin, and I'm sure of you will recognise them. Um, I have triple positive primary APS. I was diagnosed in 2005 at the age of 52, um, and it was 18 months worth of investigations following um, a TIA. I'd had previous ones which I hadn't realised during, during both my pregnancies. I didn't realise they were TIAs until I got to this stage. Um, and I was at the time working as a physiotherapist in the NHS in the community. Remember the slides? Okay. <laughs> um, not the first time that I had presented with neurological symptoms, but it was the first time I'd heard the name antiphospholipid syndrome. I was immediately started on warfarin with full instructions. However, the next 14 years to the present day, I've learned to be grateful for warfarin and frustrated by it, as it affects so many aspects and activities of my life. After a year of weekly visits to the anticoagulation clinics, I decided to buy a Coagucheck excess machine and take back some control of my life, which I felt had been lost. To be able to self-manage my condition, my INR and medication has been totally liberating and has enabled me to continue with all the activities of daily living and travel worldwide with close attention to the INR and therefore with a reduction in risk of further thrombotic events. Travel with warfarin has many hazards. It has been extremely difficult, as Cass said, um, in insurance for APS in the past, but fortunately, most companies now recognize the condition and offer reasonably priced policies, although they're pretty steep sometimes, especially when you're traveling to the States. Um, making sure you've got APS recorded properly on the insurance documents is essential. When I first applied um, for travel insurance in 2009, um, they sent me back the documents, paper documents, and it had polycythemia as a diagnosis, which is not what I've got, and they couldn't find APS on the list. Um, they did eventually, and they changed it, and fortunately they did because I um, needed some medical attention while I was on my holiday in America uh, and if it hadn't been on there um, I had a, a doctor consultation at five Clexane or Lovenox uh, syringes um, which I acquired in the US and it cost six hundred dollars <laughs> so I'm glad I was properly insured. Um, when I travel on English speaking countries I plan ahead by going to the website of that country uh, looking up APS and printing off the information about the condition in their language. That way, if I'm admitted to a hospital for any reason, I have the information available to understand. Travelling long distances, especially flying, has its own hazards as it affects the INR. And you may have to consider crossing time zones. Um, in 2009, I travelled, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel to Hawaii. This involves crossing 10 time zones uh, from the UK and is 10 hours behind us. Now, my maths brain struggles at the best of times, but this was going to be impossible to work out for me. Uh, then I had a light bulb moment. I bought a digital watch, didn't have a very good... Uh, um, mobile phone at the time which can be used now but I had a, bought a digital watch and kept it on UK time for the whole holiday. It was set to beep at the usual time I took my warfarin which was 10am so wherever I was at 12 midday in Hawaii I took my warfarin and it was a big success. Of course on holiday part of the enjoy enjoyment of the holiday is eating and drinking. 
I'm a vegetarian and I love fruit and veg, but unfortunately too many leafy green vegetables and salads containing vitamin K can reduce the INR and increase the risk of clotting. On the other hand, alcohol usually has the opposite effect and can cause the INR to rise alarmingly. So um, these effects usually occur if you binge, holidays, tempting, um, rather than having controlled regular intakes. So on holidays, I do check my INR more frequently and can adjust my warfarin and diet accordingly, and I try and be sensible. <laughs> Probably not the best slide to have put up there, actually. So uh, Another frustration has been dealing with medical staff when it comes, uh, you know, whether it's nurses, doctors, or paramedics, who are less so now, but have been unaware of APS. It's really important to be able to communicate about the condition to doctors and nurses without sounding like an internet know-all or Dr. Google. So it's hugely reassuring when you find a medical member of staff who knows about APS. There's certainly a greater awareness of the condition and the need for continuous anticoagulation now. But when I was first diagnosed 14 years ago, I often found I was having to explain APS to medical staff whilst I was being treated for something else. I'm personally extremely fortunate in having Professor Beverly Hunt OBE as my haematology specialist consultant at St. Thomas's Hospital. And locally, I also have an excellent, well-informed GP and a nurse specialist and who are both very supportive. And I know I am lucky because I have heard some horror stories of that not being the case with people. Three years ago, I had a cholecystectomy. I had my gallbladder removed. Now, surgery is complicated when you take warfarin, or can be. But Help Patients, the charity APS Support UK, produce a fact sheet for people when they have planned hospital procedures. You have to stop taking warfarin in advance and switch to injecting yourself with low molecular weight heparin on a daily basis. This process is called bridging. Postoperatively, the heparin injections continue until the warfarin that's restarted has brought the INR to a therapeutic range for you. Everything went really well at surgery, but two weeks post-op, I experienced um, increasing severe abdominal pain during one day. Um, so my GP visited, because I wasn't actually able to get to the GP, um, and she called an ambulance querying an infection or a bleed. Uh, I was pretty appalled when, two hours later, a minicab turned up um, because there were no available ambulances. Uh, it was a bit scary because by then uh, the pain was so severe I was actually unable to stand up straight. This was followed by a catalogue of errors. From the moment I struggled into the cab, arriving at A&E, not obviously going in the ambulance entrance because I was in a cab, dumped in the forecourt of urgent care, struggled to get into the building, wasn't listened to by any of the receptionists or the staff on reception, triaged briefly, left sitting for hours, and this whole catalogue of errors continued through urgent care into majors, culminating in me nearly losing my life six hours later. I was absolutely terrified. My poor children, what they went through. I'd suffered a massive internal hemorrhage, and over the next two weeks, as an inpatient, I had five blood transfusions, a constant heparin infusion, lots of combined IV antibiotics, and developed bilateral hypostatic pneumonia and pleural effusions, necessitating continuous oxygen. The medical staff on the ward were wonderful and they were supported by Professor Hunt as I was in the position of being able to clot and or bleed at the same time and it needed to be very delicately managed. Um, I'd, one of the last things I remember before I finally conked out in A&E was saying to my son, get Beverly Hunt's 
contact details out of my diary and beg them to ring her because she knows me well as a patient and um, I'd love to be involved, basically. Um, so he did. And um, I, she's helped to support with the management. Um, I had four hourly blood tests, 24 hours, day and night, for two weeks. Got to know the phlebotomists and the on-call doctors extremely well all through the day. They were wonderful. Um, the hemorrhage was caused by bleeding from the liver bed where the um, gallbladder had been removed, apparently. Um, but combined with warfarin and heparin, which I was using for post-operation bridging, um, it wasn't because I was self-managing, because apparently it would have happened anyway. I'd never been in so much pain, not even in labour, or as terrified as I was the first in a and &E. I really thought I was going to die. And before I was discharged, finally, the doctor said they thought I might too. It took me weeks to recover, physically and mentally. Also suffering post-traumatic stress syndrome from the whole episode, it was disastrous. And I was emotionally labile for months. However, three weeks to the day after I was discharged from hospital, Having missed both hen parties, my daughter got married. It was a wonderful day, exhausting, utterly exhausting, but it could have been a very different story. I'd like to point out that it's her that's doing the jumping on the bed and me pretending I am, because I struggle to actually get on the bed and get off it again. So there are a lot of considerations and potential problems warfarin. And it's an effective but complicated drug to live with. However, I've learnt to respect it and live with it. At 66 years old, I'm still very active. I have part-time jobs, having finally retired after 35 years as an NHS physiotherapist. I have a new, adorable granddaughter. I look after three days a week, 11 hours a day. Exhausting. <coughs> I play in the Croydon Steel Orchestra, which I have done for 12 years. Just missed a gig on a barge in Guildford this afternoon, but never mind. I'd rather be here today. Um, and I travel as much as possible, which I thoroughly enjoy and feel confident with my machine and being able to self-manage. So wrestling with warfarin can be hard work, needs a degree of common sense, an understanding, but it's well, for me, worth the effort. I highly recommend at this point the website APS Support UK for further information. There's the details. Um, and finally, my last slide is a question. Will APS patients always have to wrestle with warfarin, or are there any new treatments on the horizon? Thank you.